my ambition was to get married and have children because I wasn't given allowed to dream anything bigger than that. That's amazing. It's and do you teach your children? Yes. And my boy, my, my son, the first recipe he made using my cookbook was the Gima. It was so good. I'm oh. showing, I was trying to mark it up 10. I had to give 9.5. It was so good. No way. Um, it, was, it was amazing. So we call him the Gima King now. Oh, um, that's so good. He, yeah, he's six foot two and he towers me. But again, growing up, when I was a young girl, not seeing anybody of colour on the TV, on the mm. media, we didn't really have any role models. And my ambition was to get married and have children because I wasn't given allowed to dream anything bigger than that. No, but you no, probably no. didn't feel like you you could either. I mean, like just even the oh. thought of having a career because that's how we we were inbred, wasn't it? That's how we were grown we up. Were, well, we were conditioned to what a good Asian girl should do, yeah. which is marry and have children. So I did. I, I married. I met my husband. I had to tell you a funny joke. So my husband, um, I met in Yorkshire. You can hear this like Yorkshire twang. Yeah. And um, I remember he walked in, and we were guy. My friend and I was on the skin. Guys marked out of ten, and she went to look now. Twelve just walked in, <laughs> and he was so incredibly handsome and incredibly intelligent. And we got married within eight weeks. Oh wow! Oh my God! My father was very strict on, on who I should date and who I should see, but it was the right decision because we married for thirty-two years now. And, um, do you think you'd do that with your children if they kind of like? Oh my God! I know I'd go mad. <laughs> I said, "What? No, not doing that." Um, but the reason that I think he. Um, He's a huge part of the, of the jigsaw because when I married him and I just was his wife, every single event we went to, he was a property developer. I was, um, hello, I'm Mrs. Ashraf. Hello, I'm Mrs. Ashraf. I was, I was Mrs. Ashraf. And that, all I was, his wife, and I, we had three children. Again, there was no room for me to dream big. Mm. There was no room for me to have ambition because I was raising three children. And then I accidentally got a job in a nursery teaching. And the lady said, oh, Mrs. Ashraf, can you come and teach children how to make chapatis? It's so typical in uh, Ilford yeah so I remember I went in to teach chapatis and I found the children very honest and I liked it then I did a diploma in child care um, oh, wow. child care management and then from that I ran a nursery of my own from that I became an inspector of child care um, for Ofsted so I had a corporate job um, but every single job I've had has taught me something about what I'm doing now um, so now when I've got meetings with producers or directors or lawyers about TV shows I can cope by myself because I've been an ex-inspector for education um, and now I teach and write cooking lessons. And even so when I you did know my TV how to like, so you know how to be around people. You you know how to speak to them and like, and understand what they like and kinds. Because I can imagine you going into a school with children, teaching them how to what I would say ruddy, teaching yeah. them ruddy. I mean, what was their feedback? What were the, what were they what they say to you when they were? Children are incredibly honest and they love it. Um, but because I'm an ex nursery nursing teacher, I found. When I started my business, I found it easy to go into schools and do talks on diversity and teach. I remember after we were doing really well as Asians in Britain, we were doing so well, and then 9-11 happened and everything changed. Yeah, yeah. Everything changed after 9-11, including my business. Um, so then I struggled with what I was doing, but mm. one thing I knew is I had a passion for teaching. So I started mm. to write recipes. I wrote the very first recipe for my son who went to Manchester University. Oh, wow. He was 18. Have you ever tried to teach an 18-year-old boy to cook? No, I mean, teaching myself to cook is a, a, a recipe for disaster anyway. So <laughs> we should we should turn the entire our cooking lesson recipe disaster when we get together. Seriously, finally. like te teach me quick or something like, you know, um, but uh, so he actually wanted the recipe to take with yes. him. Uh, he went to university and, and I really, really missed him. He was um, and I just thought, my God, he's he rang home. He said, Mom, I thought he's oh, missing me because I was terribly missing him. Oh. He said, I need to learn how to cook. Um, I said, is that it? He said, yeah, I want to make a chicken masala. They made the chicken, uh, wrote the recipe, it didn't work. And I said, what are you using? He said, shop bought spices. I said, no, 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 no. You need to use the homemade garam masala. Yeah. So, I, I, so I made a little jar, and when we drove, drove to Manchester, I gave him the jar. Oh, wow. He put too much in, it didn't work. Right. He said, can you just measure it out and put it in little packs for me, mum? So that's it. So I designed a little curry kit for him with the recipe card, each number step by step by step no with a way. sachet, and that's how my business was born. Oh, my God. So that was... That was oh my god, that's it's amazing! Yeah, and, and that's why the feedback I get from people is the recipes are really incredibly easy because I've watched it for an eighteen-year-old boy. He I mean, has, he's got an algebra, algebra, algebra-based mind. He has a mathematical mind, but he has no common sense. <laughs> <laughs> but he can cook, right? Well, he learned to cook. He's not the best cook. He cooks because he has to. My daughter 
has learned a lot from books and incredible yeah. cook. My youngest son probably is the most talented. And my husband's an amazing cook as well. So is it is it like a family tradition that you all kind of in the kitchen? Is it because cooking is bonding, right? I mean it, it brings people Especially together. now, especially yeah. now, Sharon. It's huge at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I've started baking with my daughter, so we've we've just done a banana bread together and she did like it. You know, I've got to be careful as well because of her attention span as well. Like kids can get easily bored. But if she's me- if if she's like measuring the stuff in and if she's pouring it in and if she's stirring and things like that, it does make a difference. And you know, I I would really like to kind of bring the Indian food, you know, to it, the Indian cooking within that as well. So in your family, is it something that everyone kind of mucks in together, or is it a place where when you all cook, you're you're bonding and like you t- you're talking about like your day? Is it something that Happens in your well, it's, it's very old-fashioned ideas, but we remember with the COVID, I wrote a double-page column in our newspaper this, this particular week, and it's all about going back to basics, because we're all together in the kitchen, in the yeah. house, which is quite new for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and whereas people had no time to cook and we go out to eat, we can't go out to eat at the moment. We can get takeaways. So I've written a recipe for a, um, a family takeaway. It's a lamb cheese burger and a spicy wedgie. Oh, and it's for children delicious. to make with mums and dads. Um, so we sometimes take it in turns to go, believe it or not, Sharon, when I was catering and I was catering for my Bollywood dinner parties, my clients, yeah. I would come home at two o'clock in the morning and I would have a bottle of cornflakes. Oh, yeah. I would I be know. that tired of cooking. But, um, so we take it in turns and my younger son, um, we all cook together. My daughter's isolated in London. Yeah. My eldest son's in Africa, isolated. My husband's here with myself and my son. And when I'm busy doing my column or writing or doing my spice cakes, my husband will cook chicken masala. But last week he wanted to make a saga loo. He oh said, my oh, God, saga loo. How do you make saga? I went, just look at the book. <laughs> he said, Brian, what about, um, you know, the rice? How much water should I put in? He went, just look at the book. So <laughs> <laughs> um, now the other day I caught him watching my YouTube channel. Oh, what does he think? What's your feedback with your family of you being like this woman on expert cook, you know, on TV? I mean, what? how do they feel about having a celebrity oh, you know family? What? Because... Um, after the cop, my youngest son is 22. He cannot remember me being an inspector for office, but he can't remember being in the corporate world and wearing a suit oh, going to work. He can only remember me doing spices. Um, oh. But I did a show called Come Dine With Me about um, yes, you did, yes. And it was really funny because they called me Picky Parveen. <laughs> and again, somebody on the channel was racist. Somebody on my show, was, on my group was racist and it came across quite racist, but she was very sort of um, ignorant of people of my culture. And it brought up a lot of conversation and Channel 4 said we're not going to show it. She kept calling me a packy again on camera. What, in what sense? That that is what you are or is that...? Yes, that's why I am. Oh that's what goodness. she said I am. So Channel 4 didn't show it. But what I found after doing Come Dine With Me was that I quite like being in the camera. But lucky for me, in Peterborough, where I live, there's a shopping channel called Idea World. So I made my debut shopping show there at about 12, 13 years ago. So for my children, my husband, it's the norm for me mm. to be on TV. Yeah. So when, um, fast forward five years, I wrote the cookbook for my son and we had the spices. But then I think at 50, I thought, Do you know what, Sharon, it's not happening in the cover world. Nobody wants to publish my cookbook. Nobody wants to know about me. So I decided to give up 50. Oh. Putting a limitation on myself. And I thought, okay, on paper, you would say to somebody, okay, we've got this 50 year old Muslim Pakistani woman she wants to be a TV chef, you'd be like, yeah, no, I don't think so. No. People would not picture me, would they, Sharon? Well, I think many years ago, no, but I think nowadays, because I think as well, like, your audience, you know, I'm, I'm one of your audience. I am someone that wants to learn how to authentically cook Indian food. I want it easy, and I want it, yep. like, so I can actually read it properly, because there's lots of cookbooks out there. I just get overwhelmed, totally confused. And yeah. like also and the ingredients is on two pages. You've got to turn the page oh, over. Karen, that thing, I'm so glad you said that because exactly was my thinking is I want to make it simple and easy to cook. So, you know, yeah. I am going to send you something to cook. But going back to where I felt at 50, having had my three children yeah. and having, and I wrote recipes down and I had the manuscript on my laptop for five years. I must have emailed a publisher one every two weeks for about two years. And I kept getting no's and it's so many no's you can take. And yeah. I just thought, do you know what, it's time to give up and get a job in hospitality or cooking so, or, or maybe teaching. Yeah. And I'd gone to see my mother who had a heart attack. And she oh. said, um, and I walked in and all the nurses were smiling. I said, mum, how do they know who I am? She was, oh, I should have the tutu thing that you do. <laughs> and 
I said, what tutu? She oh. goes, the tutu, see, the tutu that you do. So oh. She's turned on YouTube. Um, yes. So I said to her, I'm going to give up. Well, I'm 15. It's not happened, so therefore it's not going to happen now. I'm trying too hard. It's not meant to be. Yeah. No one's going to publish this book that we want to do together. And in the last volume of her life, she'd give me lots of recipes and ideas. Little things like sea salt, Himalayan sea salt. My gosh, Sharon, Himalayan sea salt is trending massively. Turmeric yeah. everywhere. Oh, turmeric we've, coffee. Oh my God, I know. But we've been healthy dudes for like I centuries. know, I know. I know. Um, so the last chapter we wrote with me and mum was about Himalayan sea salt. And she'd been using it for over 60 years. Oh my God. It was trending when she was a young wife. Finished army wife with my dad. Yeah. And I remember yeah. her saying to me, Oh, Green, this is really good. I'm thinking, How does she know what this Himalayan salt is? Oh, wow. And of course, now we all know it's good for some mineral as opposed to a chemical yeah. and it has really good healing properties, etc. That's why we had the salt lamp. So, all that information is in the book with her recipes, her stories, my life. And I wrote it, but it was really hard to get the attention of any kind of yeah. publisher. So, I decided to give up when I hit 50. And then I rang mum. I went to see her at the hospital. She was really, really ill. And she said, what's happening? I said, nothing. So I'm going to give up. So she said, mm. don't give up. I said, in the corporate world as a brown woman, it's not happening. Mm. So she said, well, I want you to keep going to get there. And she was, remember who you are, Harvey? And I said, who am I? I'm just tired of it all. She said, you're an incubator baby. And you were an incubator and you survived because you have a strong spirit. And you will survive. You'll get through this. Mm. So she then said, um, don't give up. And the third time she said it, I thought, you know what, she's not gonna, she had tubes up her nose, she had the ECG machine on mm. and everything. And she said, I want you to continue to do what you're doing. Mm. And I said, why is that? She said, I have my seven children, you are the strongest. And she goes, oh you've got goodness. a strong spirit and don't give up. So eventually I did promise her and that was um, the night before. And then- um, I know, and then- and, She died the following morning. But you are, but, how amazing is that that her last words to you she saw something in you that you couldn't see yourself and to be honest with you look what from that conversation look what you've become and if anything she'd be she is so proud of you i mean even i'm getting tearful like that's, that's i think um, amazing and then literally six weeks after she died um i got the book deal <sighs> i got a publisher interested and the first thing i did was have to write about my mum in the past. Yeah. I remember me and my publisher and I said, I'm so incredibly exhausted. She said, well, welcome to the world. You are now an author because I put all my energy and my love. Yeah. Book. I'm going to have to send you a copy, Sharon, because it's dedicated to my little mum and she was an amazing woman with an amazing talent to cook and she was just yeah. passionate and she saw that in me and so she passed on that knowledge to me and I am. I love cooking and I have a real joy for it, a real love for it and get that from her. Yeah, and I think you, you probably do because she sounds like a real survivor and I think a lot of people in that, that generation, they were survivors, you know, they came over no, not they knowing language. They came into a cold country, not speaking the language. Yeah. And my mum, Sharon, used to work in Bradford's second takeaway, first or second takeaway, five pound a week. Oh my God, I know. So, you know, when you have that kind of, even now with COVID-19, what's happening and our children, my children are complaining. And I heard my neighbour saying, well, at least you, you're queuing without being bombed by Hitler. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, this is the toughest times our children have to go through. But our parents really did suffer mm. with racism, not knowing who they were. And they held on to that identity. And I still believe the way that we will, your children will, your children's children will hold on to their identity yeah. is from the food, from my heritage. My three children all live separately now. Yeah. When they come home, first thing I do is they all gather in the kitchen, all three of them, and I make hot roti off the pan, and oh they, they this transport them to being children again. But doesn't it transport you as well? I mean, like, you know, you say about your mum cooking and she used to make, you know, use the same ingredients and make the food like you did. Like, I kind of, I feel like when you're, I mean, do you feel it when you're cooking? Like, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I when... have a belief in spirituality and energy. Yeah. Um, and I truly believe that when I cook, um, so if you, were to, if you were to taste my food, I mean, I cook for, very affluent people who want mm. the best of the best. And I, I feel I offer the best of the best. And they, I always say, what's the one key ingredient? And they say, is it cumin? Is it saffron? I'll say, no, it's love. Yeah. It's the passion of what I do and how I do it. Um, so if you have passion for anything in life, including you with your podcast now, it's a new thing that you're doing. If you've got passion for it, it will show. Yeah. It's not a job. To me, it's not a job. It's what I do. It's part of me. 